victims of child abuse and neglect. Today's topic for our webinar will focus on a public health approach to rehabilitating street and working children. Right now I have everyone on mute to avoid background noise. We welcome you to enter your questions and comments in the chat box throughout the presentation. The presenter will answer any questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. Dr. Rajiv Seth is a current ISPCAN counselor and the current chairperson of the Indian Child Abuse, Neglect, and Child Labor Group. Dr. Seth obtained his medical pediatric training at All India Institute of Medical Sciences and at the University of California, San Francisco. For the past 14 years, Dr. Seth has been working as a volunteer to provide medical care and rehabilitation services to orphaned and vulnerable children in India. He strongly believes that in developing countries, child protection must include protection from not only abuse and exploitation, but also from disease, poor nutrition, and illiteracy, which you will hear about today. Dr. Seth is known in the field as editor of Cancel News, co-author of a 2013 book on child abuse and neglect, and contributor to many scientific peer-reviewed publications. He has received several academic awards and is affiliated with a number of professional organizations, including as fellow of the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Rajiv, we thank you for being with us today and for your work with ISPCAN. Now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody, and um, I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, uh, greetings from New Delhi, India, and uh, it's my proud privilege, uh, and thank you, ISPAN, for giving this opportunity to speak on a public health approach to rehabilitating street and working children. What I'm going to talk is relevant to challenges with working with street children worldwide, mainly in the developing countries. However, it is a, a worldwide problem, and, and street and working children, unfortunately, represent a great violation of human child rights, as well as uh, a, 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 a national shame wherever they are. Because this is really not just a something children deserve better and for whatever reason. So as we go along, I will structure my talk in a way so that I have clear definitions for you uh, and also uh, uh, talk about a little bit of my work uh, in public health domain amongst the street children in India. Uh, now how the street children are defined is by the United Nations are that any minor boy or a girl for whom the street becomes his or her abode, or the source of livelihood. And when the child is inadequately protected or supervised by responsible adults. So this is the UN definition of 2002. However, within this definition, there are at least four classes of street children. Children could be at risk, children on the streets, children off the streets, and abandoned children. Now children at risk are those children who live with their families but supplement their income by working on the streets. They obviously come from extremely poor marginalized families. Children on the streets are predominantly home-based who spend a portion of the day on the street but they have a family support where they usually return home at night. Children off the streets are street-based children who spend most of the time, whether it's day or nights on the streets, who are functioning with minimal or no family support. Then lastly, there is a class of abandoned children, those who live completely on their own without any supervision by adults. This is a huge public health problem, and as you can look into the UNICEF data for 2003, it says that 100 million street children are present worldwide. We don't have a reliable government of India data for you, 
Well, we know the NGO, the non-profit data, which says 18 million street children are present all over India. Now, as the developing world is entering into uh, urban-centric, this rapid urbanization, which is a real challenge, uh, in urban metro cities, street children are our numbers are increasing. They usually are runaway migrants and they come from underserved states and villages. The UNDP believes that about 53% of the developing world will eventually live in the cities by the year 2020. So as this rapid urbanization is posing an extreme challenges and, and migrants and families or displaced families are moving to cities for search of livelihood and, and, and also the children who run away from their homes, broken homes and families, they, they are increasing in numbers within the metros in the developing cities. What are the etiology factors? The predominant and the most important uh, problem is economic, which is poverty. And as there is widespread disparity in economic levels and, and, and survival, the basic rights are not available and this is forcing these children into hunger and starvation and they have to become a, a laborers. Now there is also the social issues that the, from the villages because where there is no development, there are no job opportunities, People are migrating from the villages into the urban areas and then there can be natural disasters such as floods or droughts which can also bring these migration uh, from the villages. Then children who come from dysfunctional families where there's also a, a lack of education or extreme forms of uh, economic hardships, unemployment, um, these children would just run away from their homes. Uh, political issues uh, are also violence, victims of war. So there, these are multifactorial reasons why a child would be on the street. Our UN Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon in 2013 uh, wrote his piece on migration what he said was migration is an expression of human aspiration for dignity, safety, and better future. It is a part of human fabric, part of, of every family. So we all like to migrate for better opportunities, for better future. However, the street children are, are, are really uh, the root cause uh, of their migration are really they are forced into it. It is not their own sweet will, but sometimes they are misguided children. Their age range in, amongst the street children can be varying from eight years to 17 years. But in my practice, I see very few girls on the streets, about 10% hardly. So the issue always haunts me as to where these girls are. And unfortunately, the sad fact is the street girls are really into the red light districts, into brothels where they are abused and there's gender-based violence to a large degree. Most of these children have no formal education or job skills. And the tragedy is the government and the researchers on public health have not addressed this problem since long. India has a huge influx of urban migrants and in our cities, 15 million of them could be children, the 2007 data. Climate changes, poverty, conflicts, natural disasters, inequities of various kinds. You know, development, you know, India as a country is developing and, and the development itself is leading to displacement of children or families, which no one mentions. Street children, I mentioned my NGO data roughly is about 18 million. So, so essentially, you know, different classes of street children would be, some children would be engaged in construction work, some as, as shoe shiners, 
working in eateries and dhabas or roadside shops, working in, in restaurants or, or engaged in, in cheap labor. So it is something, it's a very tragic, uh, uh, majority of the, my patients initially when I started working in this field were rag pickers. Then all of us would be sleeping, they would get up from their homes, wherever they are on the streets, they're around four or five in the morning and will go into picking rags and collect the precious items amongst the rags and sell it to a middle level kabari or a middle level shopkeeper to earn some money for their keep. It is, it is a tragedy and it certainly needs somebody to address. This is where we are located in New Delhi and it's a um, huge big region. I would say South Asia is highlighted in this map, whether it's Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, Burma, Minar, now called Minar, they all have street children and South Asia has real big amounts and we don't have reliable data, but the entire South Asia region is affected by huge influx of migrants and street children in their metros and cities. Now, coming to the New Delhi experience, uh, over the last uh, almost now 16 years I've been working uh, uh, with the street children and, and, and the opportunity that came to me was through a non-profit organization. When I moved from the United States to New Delhi, uh, I had the opportunity to work with the American non-profit PCI where, where I used to volunteer my time. I was initially doing only once a week, then I started doing twice or thrice a week depending upon my needs and the availability that I, I could spare the time. And gradually and gradually we started establishing uh, drop-in centers. I'm going to speak a little bit more on that. But I want to uh, tell you that in New Delhi, as I was my very really first experience of working on the streets myself, I realized that there were appalling conditions on the streets. Uh, all the development has taken, New Delhi is the national capital of the country, still there's so many 46 resettlement colonies and more than 100,000 individuals in these colonies who live in appalling condition. There was paucity of data at that time and there was no slum census and would see new slums would mushroom every six to seven months comprising mainly of migrant population. It is also roughly estimated by us that about 40 to 50 street children would migrate from neighboring states into New Delhi. These children come with no education, with no job skills, and, and they are uh, either employed uh, in, in ad hoc basis, or they would be just beggars on the street, rack pickers, cleaners, shoe polishers, and these scanty payments. So there's a lot of abuse and exploitation that goes along uh, as in during their work. Um, I mentioned this, 100 million street children, 80 million, uh, and this rapid urbanization, which is a throwing a big, big challenge. Talking about the health issues that we see uh, in these children, the physical challenges, malnutrition, communicable diseases, including vaccine preventable diseases, because many of these children have never been into formal health systems, so they, are, they don't have preventive vaccinations. Mental health is a major challenge. And you only come to know when you actually day in, day out engage with them. Social isolation is a major risk factor for these migrant children. This lack of health information, language, and there are also cultural differences because they come from various regions and states. And, and, and also they faced uh, with a lot of exploitation, abuse, and neglect, which I believe is a major public health problem in these children. Now, child protection challenges are, are huge. Violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation. As I started working with them, I realized there's a high prevalence of substance abuse in these children. These children uh, were taking volatile uh, inhalants or whatever was available in the streets to just let go of their angst and anxieties. And other thing was, exploitation, exploitation both commercially as child laborers and also sexual exploitation. 
In our study, we, we, we found that more than 50% of children had poor nutrition, malnutrition, anemia. Majority of the health problems include repeated injuries, trauma, uh, lack of vaccinations leading to infections such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, skin infections like scabies and pyoderma, gastrointestinal infections like diarrhea and amoebic infections, a high prevalence of drug abuse, smoking, alcohol, glue sniffing, cocaine, smoking, all and sexual abuse and exploitation and survival sex and group sex and, and high prevalence of HIV and STD have been shown in, in such vulnerable populations. The other thing we find is mental health challenges, poor self-esteem, willpower, problems with uh, corporal punishment uh, lead, and also problems related to sexual exploitation will give rise to a lot of mental health challenges and being on their own in socially isolated situations is extremely challenging for these children. Now BUDS India is, is, a, is a small nonprofit uh, uh, which is established about 14 years ago in 2003. Uh, it works in, in two slum locations now in Nizamuddin Railway Station and near the Red Fort, Old Delhi Railway Station. And why we chose railway stations is because many of these children come out into the railway, through the rail, rail route. They would just get into a train and they would um, just take the next train wherever the train is going. And, and, and this is where we would encounter them. And uh, Besides this, we also work in villages or underprivileged villages in Mewak, but most of my data is, is from underserved locations in urban slums of Delhi. You know, when we started the project, our goal was simple. We wanted to uh, reduce their vulnerability. We wanted to uh, help them in whatever way. We didn't know what to do for them. Uh, we are not government. We don't have that much resources, but there was a passion and I was not alone and there were a whole group of uh, about 20 yard, I would say at that time, uh, staff uh, of a nonprofit was started working with great passion. And I'm very proud to say that out of the 20, 15 of them still have worked with me for the last about 14 years. Uh, we try to address their education, health, physical, psychological uh, issues. We also look at life skills and we look forward to develop them vocationally so that they ultimately can be on their own with some job skills. Uh, Drop-in center is a model and this is how we work. We have established drop-in center with the two apartments, let me tell you, in, in, in slum locations just adjacent to the slums which have easy access to the street children. There are studies to show in my Cohen in, in US and other countries in Brazil and South American cities that drop-in centers are one of the most effective interventions for street children. What you do in a drop-in center is that these we, we get children through our outreach workers. In the morning, our outreach worker will scout for them in railway stations, in, in locations which are so-called dangerous or slum locations, interiors where these children would be there. And, and, and talking to them and, and, and trying to, we try to engage with them as soon as they arrive in from the railway station. And, and what we try to do is that get them into our drop-in center because they need a safe place and safety is very important. And since the children are either school dropouts from class one or two, they don't have any, any formal education many, many times. We provide them a safe place where they get a midday meal and snacks during the day, uh, dinner at night, uh, give them a basic uh, non-formal education to begin with and provide them preventive and basic health care. And me as a pediatrician, my, I start, I, I just, I, I wasn't a social worker trained as a pediatrician and I started working providing them basic health care services. And, 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 and initially I was just visiting once a week, then we improved and we were visiting sometimes twice or thrice a week as need be. These centers are generally located, uh, ours are located near the railway station, but you could have your centers in busy places, uh, marketplaces where these children could be. You see our initial approach is always to repatriate these children to their homes. And as per the laws of, uh, of the government of India, 
we are bound to report these children whom we encounter to our child protection services which in India are called by the name of child welfare committees. Child welfare committees are organized for care and protection of these children and care or protection of these children is extremely important and the child welfare committee of the government are only empowered to look at the best interests of these children and see what can we do. Initial approach is always to uh, file a police report and, and then to try to identify their families and see if we can repatriate them back to their families. However, many, many children come from broken families and homes and their families are not easy to find and they have to be given a shelter. They are then enrolled into shelter homes or, or uh, in child care institutions which are government approved. Our drop-in centers uh, have been functional for the last uh, 17 years now and started the first one in 2000. The studies done worldwide in Honduras, in Brazil, and other developing countries, and, and there are also studies by Slexnik in the U.S. that drop-in center is the way to approach them. They need a safe place where their health needs, their mental health, substance abuse, education, other issues can be, uh, can be addressed. There's a paper in our own Child Abuse and Neglect International, which was published last year by Nath et al., with the benefits on physical health, their mental health, and on their substance abuse, reducing their substance abuse habits once they are rehabilitated in the drop-in centers. Now, our strategic aim is to reach out to these children, and it is not easy if you sit in your air-conditioned offices, you need to go into the community and find and, and, and another very good approach that we found and we have developed, which we have recently upscaled, is the mobile health clinic approach. Uh, they are in all over the place, but certainly they all have health issues. Uh, they need primary health checkups. They, they need to be integrated into either the government immunization drives or our own camps for immunization services. We provide them daycare facility, meals in our drop-in centers. We also provide them non-formal education. If we succeed in home repatriation, wonderful. There was a program several years ago where we actually uh, did our best. It was a well-funded program by the UK Children's. And we realized that repatriation was not the solution because almost 25% of the children despite all the hard efforts, even if they were repatriated, would run away again. So there was a vicious cycle. So what do you have to do? At least while they are with you, you give them non-formal and formal education. Non-formal education is simple, and we have remedial as well as non-formal education. Teachers, experts on board with us. But formal education comes from government schools and also through the national school, open schooling because many children cannot then go into a formal education plan if they are 15 or 16 and they have not had uh, education beyond the grade 2 or 3 it's a big challenge how you get them into the mainstream schools and therefore national open school where they can children be graduated from class 6 then gradually into 8th and 10th in leaps and bounds and there are opportunities that we try to explore through these routes those children who are, who are um, uh, well, it takes time for us to understand their needs. We have tried to understand what their skills are and the capabilities and what capacities they have. Some children would like to learn English and vocational skills are really important. And once they start learning some English and they know it, then easy easy way is to get into a computer educational curriculum which is specifically designed for them to to give them skills for job placements as and when uh, they reach that levels we also try to raise their self esteem all through the year through sports through cultural programs there's an annual children's day event which has become not only limited to the slums that we serve but all over pan delhi that we have more than 300 to 500 children on the Children's Day, which is a national day, which is the 14th of November every year, which is celebrated, where children come with their cultural programs, would be dramas, theater, uh, they will be, we challenge them with quiz contest and we give them opportunities for on-spot painting and recreational and sports activities. 
the idea is to not only identify what they can do and to somebody be there to uh, to support them, to clap when they are able to do something well on stage, and then to award each and every child who participates. Essentially, as I mentioned to you, the mobile van which we have just launched, and this is brand new, is is supported by the Price Waterhouse Cooper, which is uh, an international uh, audit company, and and they they came up um, uh, with supporting, which we we very thankful to them. This 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 is Eicher van. It's a German model which has been fabricated to the needs of our uh, uh, three children. You can see the interiors, uh, which is like a absolutely. This is uh, it has been designed in the philosophy of these three P's. The first is prevention of health. Secondly, prompt treatment. Uh, prompt treatment, I mentioned, there could be injuries, they need tetanus shots, they need the bruises, they need a lot of other things prompt. They have high fevers in the street and infections to control and other things. Sexual transmitted diseases. All those things are late emergencies. And then it's promotion of health because we always believe in this philosophy of promotion of health because if you don't do that, you're failing in your duty. And just putting a band-aid approach of addressing acute health care needs will not take. As you can see there's a TV screen which is uh, once I finish my office uh, in here this is my office you can see the chair I sit and next to that is the examination table and after the, all the curative health services clinic is over the next half of the day is, is, is for group sessions for counseling and services related to mental health addressing social determinants of health and this is in this, but other children actually continue to do their vocational training, they continue to do their remedial education plans in our drop-in centers. So mobile health is, has, is something that we believe is extremely important. This van is now going to reach out to more than 25,000 children in one year. Now, remember, we in the last about 13 years have only reached about 25,000 children. Uh, but this mobile van in one year, so access will improve. This was launched by the Deputy Commissioner of Child Health of the Government of India. And it was a big, big celebration with almost all children in the area who were free that day participated. And we had good uh, pictures, we had, we had good fun with them. And then we went into the, in the underserved villages. This is absolutely uh, so interesting that the, the government of Mewat in Haryana introduced us to about six brand new villages and these are in the urban, uh, like unlike the urban model, our great challenge. We are still going to learn. This is the first time we have gone into the villages and, and, and this was the first meeting or the launch of our vehicle over there and addressing public. So this, this van was green. You see the green flag. It was flagged out by the district magistrate himself. And they, they have given us support. It's not just me. They have given us two doctors, and those doctors are going to help us uh, in medical examination and also referral networks through the other government hospitals where the children could be referred. So it's, it's amazing. And this is Sandhya, our, our, our outreach worker who reaches us. And you can see this, this child. Uh, whom she's talking to, and uh, um, you know, we they're extremely vulnerable. We try to identify with their families. We go back to their families, and we talk to them, and and tell them about our drop-in centers, and invite them over to come over. Many of their families are, if they're there, they are either daily wage earners, earning maximum about hundred dollars in the whole month. So you can see the challenges. The poverty is like six thousand rupees for a family of five, mother, father, and three or four children. So it's extremely challenging situations economically for these children. Our BIRDS program includes uh, uh, both girls and boys, uh, uh, give them meals, give them fun recreation time. And this is the last picture here, which you see on the bottom, shows that uh, they went to a cricket stadium. Now, cricket is, is a big sport in, in India. And this is the first time they actually they went and saw a cricket match in their life. Uh, uh, you know, many of these girls who come into our vocational, this thing, and learning computer skills and, and get into job skills, are, and we try to place them into uh, 
uh, job opportunities, so they will be off the streets. Uh, health and educational services have to reach uh, into very, very difficult regions, and the mobile van has really helped us. This is a picture which was taken before we had the mobile van, and you can see uh, on a typical clinic uh, on one particular day, I end up seeing about 80 to 100 patients and a scale about five, four to five hours. And I sweat. And, and this is a clinic which was taking uh, in, in, in the Aganwadi centers. These are centers which the government established for children less than six years. And, and over here, uh, uh, you know, screening these children. They're just so doctors. So it's like getting them screening and to try to find out if their children have other health morbidities such as children with disabilities. Because one of the things that in my experience I found that if you are on the streets or you're vulnerable and if you're disabled, then the challenges become at least 10 times more. And to screen them early and to try to identify and intervene early through referrals and support systems. So in all, since 2000, when this first time, we have, we have reached out to almost 25,000 children, and we have now launched this van. So we expect that we'll reach out to more than 25,000 children per year. Uh, so far, we more than 7,000 children have received non-formal education and drop-in centers. We provided free medical care, including vaccinations, including drugs, uh, to more than 37,000 children, uh, midday meals, counseling, and we try to mainstream up till about 1,500 children who've been mainstreamed, and, and some of them are really good success stories. And it really pleases me that health is just not doing health. You know, it is, it is a public health has an important, immense uh, potential to change lives of these children. Because while providing health, as a doctor, you earn their respect pretty quickly. You are able to get into their communities, into their families, wherever the families are available, and you can counsel them into. And you can also, through the drop-in center, monitor their health and education, and subsequently make a life for these children. Vocational rehabilitation is extremely important. Uh, uh, children who were not in schools, or we, who never been in schools, or they have dropped out of the grade two and three, cannot be just mainstreamed so quickly. So besides the remedial education, we try to get him to open schooling where they can jump start to class five exam, then seventh, and eighth, that way gradually. And there are different vocational skills to choose from. This can come through counseling one to one uh, with the child and what where where what their basically their interest lies and what they would like to do, whether they want to one of the child Pintu wanted to be his only dream was to sit next to a computer in an office. So he's now, uh, he's, he's so skilled, not just in ours, this thing, he's also just completed a bachelor's in computer application and then subsequently on his own, till bachelor's we supported him, but beyond that he's himself supporting his master's education in computer technology. Somebody wants to be an electrician or plumber, or, these are skills they can need. Girls would like to become beauticians or, or get into hospitality, hospitality industry. Some of the children have gone into various garments and export houses. And, and depending upon what there are, uh, many, many children have been able to achieve higher education and successful job placements for them. This is Eid Mohammed, our, our, our IT person who's our, uh, who provides all the computer education and training to, and it comes in batches, a couple of three months course, and, and, and this computer education is, we intentionally, and especially if they are families, we ask, take a very nominal fee so that it, they feel that they are engaged and involved, and we don't take, give this service free. It also gives them the, an opportunity to realize that they're doing something for themselves. So, uh, Again, we have referred children to child welfare committees where need be repatriated about 1100 or close to 1200 children into their homes and had vocational skills in more 7000 children. And so far we have placed more than 2200 children in successful jobs in their lives. So this is where we are. This is Pintu. I mentioned about Pintu on your left hand side where he is now pursuing a master's in computer application, he has a chance, not only chance, he's already living a very dignified life. And on, on my right is Kavita, who comes, his family is uh, 
father is a vegetable seller, uh, earns about $100 the whole month, works from morning to this thing. The mother goes here and there into homes to domestic course, and they have six children. And she was the eldest when she came. She was very shy, very inhibited, not opening up, um, getting into the remedial education, getting English skills, getting into a vocational training. Now she has a successful, good job in a, I believe, a mobile network company. So that's how it is. And we work through peer leaders. You know, we can't do it all themselves. Children get influenced by other children. So we identify the peers, the children who are who themselves want to take leadership roles. So we have a peer leader training curriculum and we, we pay them a little bit a stipend or something once they become peer leaders and they help us in uniting and uplifting lives of these children. The annual sports day or the children's day, the cultural event is organized every year and there was a time that I was traveling to Malaysia for the last 2015 I remember uh, for our Hispan con conference, the APCAN and I just did not have time because uh, to organize this, but you wouldn't believe there was this one child who's, who, and there was our social worker, they wrote to me that all children are looking for you and where are you and we want to have. So within a short span of about three weeks, we put this event forward because children are feeling part of it and they, they want to uh, be appreciated like just you, children from our own, own homes. And every child needs to be given an opportunity. The only thing is that we are small and, and the challenges are huge. And I said, it runs in millions. But you know, that's the way it is. Every drop counts to fill the ocean. So with this, that philosophy continue to work. We inspire them. These are uh, respected chief guests and guests of honor giving awards at the end of the day. And having told you this, this is one part of my talk. In the next few minutes, I will talk to you some of the research projects because, you know, it is not just all service. It is also something for us. We want to serve and we want to collect data. We want to collect information and we want to do research, which is, which is going to benefit the lives of these children. So this is uh, my work on substance misuse uh, on addictive behavior in these children from smoking to IV drug abuse. Huge problem within India. Although uh, we don't have very reliable data, but we know it's, it's pretty much as common in substance, whether you are living in the developed world or the developing countries. So volatile substance misuse was a commonness. You know, when I would go for the afternoons for my off, uh, clinics in the street children clinic, I would see most of the children would be doped up, drowsy, not eating, sleeping on one corner, sometimes very neglectful of the health. And, and with more probing and all, I realized that they were on drugs. And one of the commonness that we see is the corrective fluid they are using. This is made by Course India, a company for erasing typing errors. And it has tauline, which is a methylated benzene, which is an erotic hydrocarbon. This is freely available in the streets of Delhi for as low as half a dollar, which is about 30 rupees or so. And these children, after their rack picking, they earn some money and they would just go and buy this. And then this, this they would use it and, and they would either inhale it or they huff or puff on it and ultimately get high on it. The, the other consumer products like gasolines and mod glue and paints and lacquers, they, are, they also contain the same thing, but predominantly I saw the corrective fluid habit, of course, was a main problem. So the toluene itself inside is very addictive. Like I mentioned, easily available, uh, now costing about 0.4 dollars, and so it's very easy. Sometimes they share, they put it in a bag and sniff it, or huff it, and this high goes rapidly. But the challenges are that this can hurt a child. If taken in a large amount, it can be cardiac toxicity, they can start sudden cardiac arrhythmias and death, or it can cause sudden blindness. Uh, in developed countries like Japan, they have, they don't have open, and, and many other, even UK, and I'm sure in US and other developed countries, they don't have this uh, corrective fluid being sold as open market like that. It is processed in a, in a pen or a, in, a, in, a, in such a way that it is not used. But 
but in our part of this this country still it is used despite our study and the study has been published and I just wanted to just share a few objectives of the study we wanted to understand the uh, what are the characteristics of Taolini letter users? We wanted to understand the perceptions and determinants of the users. We wanted to generate prevention and also wanted to intervene through some strategies to not just reduce but eliminate this habit. And looking at this, uh, we designed a study, and that time was pretty new to research, and took help from the Indian Co uh, Council of Medical Research and the Jawaharlal Nehru University, and they were my co, uh, uh, I would say, PIs on this study. So qualitative study design, looking at interviews and focus group discussion, we were able to find that this abuse started as early as sometimes six years to about 14 years and they were spending about 0.5 US dollars in the whole day and and the Taolin was the most favored and there would there was a lot of close friends a group dynamics and peers doing it method I've already told you the feeling of high feeling of pleasure sensation feeling that they they it is something that they have to do in order to uh, you know feel good and, and and the harmful effects were never known to them and and that is something this study has clearly highlighted and we have uh, published this data in substance use and misuse one of the top journals in the US and it has also established that this is a big public health problem within uh, the metro cities we have addressed this to the health authorities to revamp and primary health care systems need to address drug abuse and substance abuse issues. Early identification is important because then counseling and referrals can really help these children. The devastation of both physical and psychological effects of abuse could be uh, really undermined and on their life could be damaging. Law enforcement is not the only solution. In fact, it's the last solution. But we need more education. We see the society in the community need to be more educated and also somehow this should be banned and or it should be processed in a certain way so this substance is not available in the open market. So this was a published study if you want to have a look at this. It was published in Substance Use and Misuse in the year 2005, an ethnographic exploration and of Taliban abusers in the street and working children of Delhi. So if you want to know, and this study, by the way, is one of the landmark studies because it is used in several European institutes of sociology, of anthropology, and to wherever they're studying dynamics of street children and substance abuse. In fact, I had one of the PIs from Europe who visited me, dropped from nowhere, and I was so excited just meeting him because he wanted to go and visit our drop-in centers because he read a paper and he was very interested. He was doing similar work in Brazil and he wanted to get more insights. So there's lots you can learn from just doing a study. And, and switching gears, like I said, there's always a deep desire within us and our trustees to work in the villages. So one of the easy village that we it's not really easy because it's about 80 to 90 kilometers from where we live in New Delhi, but it is approachable by road. And we can come back home if we, even if we spend the whole day. So this is the village which was uh, where Mahatma Gandhi, one of the leaders of freedom struggle of India, he came and he promised that development will take place. But unfortunately, this village is, is, is really, really backward and, and children uh, the issues are like, uh, you know, health problems and children trying of vaccine preventable diseases. So one of the projects that we have taken up here is an indoor you. In fact, this project has been really, is, is, is very impressive because here we are using the most modern uh, information technology. And this project is an indoor U.S. project and I'm very proud that BUDS has achieved this international indoor U.S. project. This is supported by the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C. And, and my co-PI is Dr. Jan from the uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University in the U.S. and myself at the Indian PI. And, and we, we, we designed this project to, uh, for keeping the villages, uh, Gasera, the, the nodal village where we were working, because we found these communities, especially young children, like uh, 
you know, in the, in the villages, not being fully immunized, and this will lead to a lot of uh, problems, uh, including death. The image of concern we had there was a decline in immunity because these children were not coming for regular follow-up, and there was poor compliance with the government vaccination system, and therefore we designed a software. And this software has been funded by this NIH R03 grant, which runs to the end of this year. And, and the data is still in progress. You know, major challenges in working in, in, in the rural areas are uh, vaccination programs, maintaining linkages, and link the vaccine to pro positive ID of the individual child. So this novel cellular technology approach for timely immunization reminder is can therefore significantly impact health outcomes in these communities. And with this, we have continued to work uh, providing supporting government immunization drives. And what it does is we have two basic goals in this research. One is to implement a novel software for primary immunization in low-income communities. And the second goal is to evaluate the cost effectiveness to improve childhood vaccination coverage by the software platform. And this, this is, has been a, 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 an experience in itself because not just doing this project, this is the first time I myself in the last two years have understood how the National Rural Health Mission of the Government of India functions and how what are the frontline practitioners. What the frontline practitioners include ASHA workers or health workers or multipurpose health workers. It includes the ANM is the auxiliary nurse midwife, the nurse level, and also have ICDS, the development centers, the Aganwadi workers. So I've learned the dynamics. And, and implementing this was not easy and rolling through a single blinded randomized study in 800 mother and child units and children defined in less than two years and then enrolling these subjects and then assigning them the computer did all this for us into three groups one was control which is just regular government this group B was where we sent mobile cell phone reminder and the group three were cell phone reminders with compliance linked incentives. Remember one thing that although there's poverty and illiteracy and lots of socioeconomic challenges, but most of the rural homes today in India have a mobile cell phone. And therefore, it is very easy to send messages that this is your date to come for your vaccination. So after getting informed consent, uh, you you take a we take a fingerprints if people cannot uh, um, uh, uh, you know sign but then we get the ch child's demographic data we record their vaccination and and base the computer automatically sends it this is a applic app that we have developed and med apps and uh, and through that all the vaccinations have been listed on one corner the child's demographic is put. And depending every six, like six weeks, 10 weeks, 40, whatever the national immunization program is, we send them reminders two days before that day to go for their vaccinations. So we are trying to study in one group where we just give reminders alone. And the third group, we are doing mobile SMS reminders plus incentives. Like we give them no money, but we give extra 30 rupees or half a dollar or one dollar of talk time, depending on how we have structured our program. So essentially, this is very basic preliminary information for you guys, because this data is blinded. And we know for sure right now that mobile cover and internet coverage is excellent. And the communities have been very well engaged with us, very receptive. We have staff who multipurpose workers who works into um, uh, tablets, we they record the data in the tablets, and the fingerprint is easy, and and so it's a biometric. You know, you the the mother or the caretaker will just have to press the fingerprint, and out there screen will pop off, and we'll just so it is something. Uh, uh, record keeping becomes easy because in this area, the biggest challenge was data collection. So data collection is easy. So these are the things that we have been able to do as from the public health perspective. But as we go along, new ideas come up. And I believe me, all these ideas are basically uh, ideas from working in the communities and realizing what the needs are. 
And one of the biggest needs in the future, which we are developing a program, a project has been developed, uh, given for funding, we don't know, hopefully we should get some funds for this one, is about addressing the challenges of adolescent girls. Because working in the villages, we, we saw that many, many girls were not in schools, and they were married early as child laborers. As child laborers are a problem, child marriage is a huge, big child production challenge. So addressing the health needs of these girls. We also find that mental health, just addressing a separate project on addressing the girls' mental health is extremely. We also find a huge challenge of malnutrition anemia, and we have developed a program uh, which we have given for funding, which use is very simple dietary elimination and counseling techniques to eliminate fluorosis, which is a major, major toxin in some of these communities in the urban slums. Water and sanitation program and right to education is the core of the heart. And this is how in 2005, four, uh, we started working and so many people were saying, as you are a medical doctor, what are you working for education? Well, we tell them that education is right. It's a basic UN child rights. And if the government of India has signed it, there should be a law. And, 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 and through partnerships, and, and it's just not our effort, but the partners and more than 500 nonprofits and advocacy and, and to the government. The government has a right to education act. So in India, almost 90 to 95 percent children are in schools. And, and what we need, really need to address is improve and enhance their quality of learning. A lot of my health advocacy that we do is not through a small nonprofit, but through the Indian Academy of Pediatrics, the Indian Child Abuse and Neglect group, which I chair, which I have just pointed out. And, and, and through that, we do conferences. Uh, in 2011, we did a conference, uh, which is the first and I think the only conference on child abuse and neglect uh, of international status, which happened in 2011 in India. Uh, and we were able to get a huge participation, members from 40 countries, almost 800 of them, and have a great outcome document, which became an advocacy tool as we approached government to realize these two crucial rights, the right to education and right to health. While right to education has become a, a particularly a, a law, right to health for all children is a challenge that we are still pursuing. What is more important is to addressing early childhood care and development and to intervene early. Now, early childhood is defined as below six years and, and, and the needs of a child below six years, less, less than one is different. Between three to six is a, is a real small child where the health needs are predominant. And three to six is a preschool child. And, and both here, we are trying to intervene and trying to develop a project along with the lines of what the government has already included, which is called Rajshri Bal Surakshakarikam. We try to screen children for disabilities and intervene early before disability sets in. It was a real challenge that I see when I'm working in the communities, whether in the urban slums or in this thing, where I feel really helpless and it devastates me internally is when I see a disabled child. Because there's very little the health systems can offer them. Because human resources are also deficient in, in the developing countries. And not just that, the systems are not really child friendly and looking at the interests of these children. So lots of ideas, and I'm sharing this because after listening to the talk, if you have some ideas, I look forward to have them. And I like to work, and if anybody wants to visit us anytime and see one of our projects or how we have, whatever little we have achieved, I will be very happy. And if you're having similar programs in your country, please give me an opportunity to visit you so I can learn from you. Pediatricians and multidisciplinary professionals, they have a very important role to play. Provision of healthcare, education, vocational, life skill development, extremely crucial in these children. Academic research is extremely important because research gives us data. It gives us a sense of what we need to do for these lives. We can act effective advocates if we have worked uh, actually on the ground. And to advocates of UN Child Rights Convention, which is a big piece of document, and a lot has to be done. It's not that, it's a big. Uh, Indian government has done a lot already. In the last decade, there is now the UN Child Rights Convention came along. There is There are now laws against uh, sexual exploitation, like protection of children from sexual offenses. There's a Juvenile Justice Act, which has been revamped in 2016. 
these are two major laws which support children and so so a lot has to be done but one thing i always tell my friends colleagues who are not so engaged and involved that if you find a child who needs protection needs social legal networking is extremely important and if you cannot do anything at least call the child line which is operational in more than 445 cities in the country by simply dialing a telephone number called 1098 so child line will then connect these children to social legal services so thank you very much all of you for your patient learning and understanding i hope i am able to uh, inform and uh, educate you a little bit i'm sorry i uh, if i took some extra time but i i think we still have some time and and on behalf of the children of birds and also from the indian academy of pediatrics the indian child abuse and neglect group i send you my warm greetings and i look forward to meet you I hope some of you are already listed and if I take some one moment of your time that we are having in Ispan the European conference in Hague and, and so there you're welcome to come and also in Asia region, Middle East, uh, there is a conference in Dubai in November. So go through our website in, uh, of the International Society for Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect that is www.ispan.org and go and register and, and we look forward to meet you and talk to you in person. Thank you very much for your patient learning. Okay, thank you so much Rajiv and congratulations on the success of your program. Um, we have a question here from one of our participants. Uh, you mentioned support from uh, some corporations like PricewaterhouseCoopers and the Indian government. Um, this participant is curious to learn more about your funders and your budget, you know, and how, how to make such a program a reality. Okay. Yeah, you see, uh, like I told uh, tell you that uh, this is really the job of the state to protect these children from abuse and exploitation. Uh, but regardless, uh, what we are doing is a very small activity. The, uh, like I mentioned, it's huge. If the children run in millions, and in the last several years, we have reached only 25,000 children. We hope this year we're going to re reach another 25,000. So, so obviously, it needs funding. Now, funding has been a challenge. Every day is a basically a, a challenge because you're thinking where the funds are going to come. So you, you what you do is that you have to write projects. You have to connect with people. Like uh, if you look at the, the Indo-US project, which has been funded by the National Institute of Health and, and uh, the project of the Ministry of Science and Technology, the government DBT project, took almost more than four and a half years. Like we, we applied for a grant in 2012 and it took uh, 2015 for them to fund us. There was delay was more in the India and the US uh, NIH uh, had cleared a clean shit, but till the Indian government. So, so that comes to about um, 20 lakhs, which is um, uh, for a spread over two years, which supports um, uh, now in Indian rupees. Uh, I don't know how to convert that right now, but. Uh, uh, 65 or uh, 68 Indian rupees is a dollar. So we get uh, one, one lakh is 100,000 rupees. So you get 20 times that for, and, and that supports uh, the salary of uh, two field workers and one supervisor. That's it. The rest of the work that the BUDS nonprofits, now I'm not, not the only doctor, there's Professor Indra Taneja, who's another expert in this field on health promotion, who joined hand with me two years ago. And she's awesome. She's, she's trained in the US and she was in the University of New Jersey School of Medicine. And now she's come and supporting uh, initiatives for street children. There's Professor Shirvasta, who's, uh, who's my senior and has been a mentor here, who also uh, comes up whenever he has time. Then Dr. Uma Agarwal, a secretary of past secretary of the council group. We also get support uh, from the government of Delhi and government of Haryana. So there's a non-funding support. You don't even keep running for money. If even if they do, uh, you know the government, local government, they've given us doctors for 
three days of a week. So imagine I don't have to go three days a week and now, and, and the government doctors are there. They also bring medicine. So they give us medicine and also give us a paramedic. Similarly, that kind of a support we are getting in Mewat, where we've got one doctor and we've got, so that if you were to get funds for paying these doctors, it's a huge amount of money. So um, this is how, that's a non-funding part of the support. Then we have some corporate donors. Uh, now the, you mentioned, I mentioned Price Water. Price Waterhouse Cooper only came recently, and this is also you submit a project. Like we keep dialing and we keep calling and emailing to more than 100, 200 corporate social responsibility so-called initiative. This is a new initiative by the government of India where corporates who are earning more than 500 crores and one crore is 100 times lakhs, 100 into 100,000. So those big giant corporates are supposed to give 2% of your money for corporates. Uh, for donation to voluntary and non-profit organizations. So we're trying to tap those resources and uh, we've just succeeded at PwC. So that's a two-year project. They've given us a van and they've also given us support for six months for upkeep of this van and we, we, have, we have a driver there, we have a paramedic, we have an outreach worker and two um, one social worker. So We've got some support in six months, but I'm going to write another project and to get. So it's 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 not easy. It's not something, but we're just limited in those locations. And whatever we do is in these locations, and I'm not planning to expand. I'm going to go even more deeper. That's what I want to do. So funding is always a challenge, but we are making it up till now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, we are at time, but I think if it's okay with you, we'll ask one more question. Um, sure. Could you describe Could you describe a little bit more about how you meet children's needs specifically in terms of mental health? You know what? what very good question. Yeah. yeah, very good question. Extremely good question. You know, to be honest, I'm a pediatrician. I'm not a mental health specialist, and and therefore this is something which I want to learn. And this is all my idea that, and also idea from came from. Um, with from Professor Taneja who works with me that um, you know we while we we have, we have been able to take the care of their vaccinations health needs and their literally health, child survival is over but their the development really depends on their mental health the mental health is when we say we also mean their emotions addressing their behavior and 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 so we have now um, just about two, I would say two weeks ago we met the professor of psychiatry who's a medical doctor and uh, with him we are starting up a project who's going to on the mental health initiative which we are going to first the project formation and and looking at only the urban vulnerable population we also met the uh, Dr. Ambedkar University's professor of child psychology so there are a lot of psychologists who are now done their masters or on route to PhD or their postdoc step who can work pro bono or with little funds with us. So with their help, we are trying to um, form a strategy of, uh, uh, of uh, direct one-to-one -one counseling in vulnerable children, trying to identify their needs. You know, the health needs are, are, are okay, but I think more deeply getting into their mental health needs and then seeing uh, what you can do to prevent them to get worse. So prevention is better than cure. So our focus will be on preventing major crises like major depressions and substance abuse problems and other things that I mentioned, but also uh, response. So some of these psychologists are well trained, not me, but they who are trained psychologists will be actually doing uh, the complex uh, uh, CBT, uh, uh, cognitive behavior therapy. I know. Uh, it's, it's, it's routinely used in the United States, but we are very few practitioners, well-trained and also, but uh, we will try CBT, we'll see what works for them and give them opportunities for medicine if they need be, uh, once we have medical doctors and medical. And, and so this is, uh, mental health is a major challenge in poor developing countries. The systems are not developed and uh, recently, um, I try to, and through ISPAN has been very helpful, really. I meet mental health professionals all the time, and 
uh, one of our secretary uh, of ISPAN, Vicky, introduced me to her partner, senior colleague, Victoria Blinkoff, who is from the UK, Devastock, and she visited us, and she and we are also going to work on, um, you know, how how we can address their mental health through infant observation and, and a technology which is uh, telemedicine linked. So a lot of opportunities. I don't know, Heather, how it's going to go forward. Uh, right now, we're just passionately pursuing this because we feel that we address their mental health and education needs in the real, this thing, we can make them superstars in life ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Anything uh, else? I think that's that's going to be it for today. But Rajiv, thank you so much for sharing this valuable information. Um, it's obviously a very complicated issue, but your program um, is very inspiring. So we thank you again for joining thank us you. today. Um, thank, you. thank you. Yes, a thank recording you. of this a recording of this webinar um, and a PDF version of the slides will be available on our website within 24 hours. So please visit us there for more information. And we also encourage our participants to become a member of ISPCAN so that you can continue with um, webinars like this in the future. And certainly we invite you to join us um, this year at ISPCAN's 40th anniversary in The Hague, which is in October, and also in Dubai in November. Um, also, we are now accepting abstracts for the Dubai conference if you're interested. And also if you're interested in presenting or have ideas for topics for our webinar series, please share them with us by contacting us at resources at ispcan.org. Thank you again for, every, uh, for joining us today, and we hope you have a good day or night, depending on where you are. Thank you very much.